Perfection and grace came mercifully from above. One without sin, but one who was driven by love. Knowing the price, a huge sacrifice, he came to surrender.
have your Bibles, uh, uh, turn in with me to the greatest of the history books, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 19, Acts chapter number 19. And I just kind of want to kind of teach and preach a little bit here tonight, if that's all right. And uh, from Acts chapter 19, we're going to take a couple of verses, the first two verses, and then we will be doing a little study. We'll be going back to this passage, pick it up with verse number two. Bible says in Acts chapter number 19, verse number one, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? I'd like to preach tonight on the subject, spiritual diagnostics. Spiritual diagnostics. Amen. You put your Bibles down just for a second, or your iPads, or your iPhones, or your eye teeth, whatever you got. Your Bluetooth. Amen. Named after one of Sister Roxer's more infamous ancestors, Harold of Bluetooth. But uh, let's pray together right now that the God would continue to anoint us. He's already anointed his word, but help us to receive his word tonight. Father God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do in this house. We trust you, we believe you, and we stand upon your word here tonight. Father, it is not by might, it's not by power, but it is by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Father, we can't accomplish it in ourselves, but through you, I can do all things through Christ, through your spirit, through your power. We can do the job you've called us to do in this last day revival. Help us to receive that. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated tonight. I'm sure all or most of us are familiar with diagnostic or assessment test in some form or fashion or another. As we talk about the medical profession, we could talk about checkups for the bowling or health screenings like we had here the other night, the other day. Self-examinations, which are of course very, very important. In terms of automotive, we could talk about auto diagnostics and supercomputers and all the different things that are a part of that. We could talk a little bit about the realm in which there are even car health reports, if you would, that will be emailed to you in your James Bond-like car. You can see in the terms of education, we have standardized testing and college entrance exams, all of them trying to figure out exactly where a person is. In a sense, when you go into the mall, you know, the most important thing there is the directory. You got to get to the directory. I, when I preach in St. Paul, Minnesota, one of the pilgrimages that we make is to the Mall of America. And one of the first things we have to do is, of course, find the directory to find the very particular stores that we're looking for. And there are two things that we're looking for with those directories, the store we're looking for and where we are. Where are you? And so that's kind of what we're going to do here tonight a little while. We are going to take a spiritual assessment test, a spiritual diagnostic exam, if you would. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 31, in terms of our celebration of the Last Supper, the time we call communion, which we will celebrate, if you would, on the Good Friday service that we are going to have, special Good Friday service at 7 o'clock. He said, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 15, he closed the book with the words, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. There's sometimes you have to sit back and take a spiritual assessment test. Run some spiritual diagnostics on yourself on what you believe, on what you really are, on truly what God is manifesting in your life. You can see here the Bible says that Paul came to Ephesus. He had 
been there quickly once before at the end of a second missionary journey. He had determined now to hurriedly move there in the course of his third missionary journey. And the Bible says that when he went to Ephesus here in Acts chapter 19, he found, if you would, disciples. He found people who were religious. Often Paul had the opportunity to preach to people who were lost, who were pagan, uh, who were far away from the things of God. But the folks that he's going to talk to here in Acts chapter 19 were folks who believed that they were already saved. They had a form of religion, if you would. And religious people can be great people. They have discipline and they have doctrine and they have dogma. But they can also be a very mixed bag, if you would. Some are like Apollos, who he, we would meet if we read the book of Acts in Acts chapter 18, who has a limited understanding of some things. And he is hungry for all that God has for him. And when Aquila and Priscilla take him and explain some things to him, they explain the word of God more perfectly. He is open to accept everything that God has for him. But other people, if you would, they use their religion as a shield and they become defensive at the mere notion that there is more for them. Paul could have waded into a deep and heady discussion and debate. He could have begun, in a sense, to uh, begin to quote numerous scriptures and, uh, if you would, uh, get into arguments with folks. Paul had a great mind. He was a philosopher of his day. His equivalency in education would have been that of a Ph.D., many times over. But instead of that which is a, a debate, he simply chooses a dialogue. And instead, the apostle here simply probes their experience. Your experience. Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? I, I understand what you believe is important, and every word of God is pure, and we need to make sure that we are right doctrinally. But I also want to ask you about your experience here tonight. I want to find out not just what you believe with your head, but what you believe with your heart and what you believe with your life. Have you received the Holy Ghost since she believed? That's kind of a very important question to ask. You know, sometimes people have problems with standards. You know, the fact of the matter is you don't have problems with standards. You have problems with holiness. And the problem isn't just with holiness. It's with the Holy Ghost. The question is, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Are you continuing to walk after the presence and power and spirit of God? It is a vitally important question that we have to use as a mirror to ask ourselves, do I still believe in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do I still believe in righteousness, godliness, and holiness, separation, peace, love, joy, all the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the things that God is trying to produce in our life? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, the apostle said, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So I'm asking you, saint of God, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Is that something you can boldly say? I have the presence of God active in my life. I am following the will and the word of God. I've got Christ in me, the hope of glory. I've got the power that he talked about in Acts chapter 1 verse number 8. So if you're a first-time visitor here, I ask you that question. Have you received the Holy Ghost since she believed? The very fact that he asked this question demonstrates that it is possible to believe and not yet receive. It is possible. Some folks say, well, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's great. That's awesome. That is essential. Salvation is impossible without that very vital step. But have you believed and then stopped? Or have you sought the wonderful gift 
of the Holy Ghost. Have ye received the Holy Ghost since she believed. Paul is running some spiritual diagnostics on these disciples. He, he's trying to ascertain exactly where are you spiritually. And I ask you tonight, where are you in terms of the spirit? Why does Paul start here? Well, we understand what the gospel is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes extensively about the gospel. He said, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye are saved. You're saved by the power of the gospel. But notice this. You have to keep it in memory. The events of Easter that we are going to celebrate are not something we should just visit once a year. They should be something that's a part of every day of who we are and why we do what we do, and we have to keep those events center of our life. Notice what he says here. You've got to continue and keep these things in memory that I have preached unto you, lest ye have believed in vain for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures so I can see three distinct steps if you would to acquire my salvation death burial and resurrection in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, Peter tells me how to apply those steps that Jesus took to my life. How do I get the salvation that he has purchased for me in here? How do I acquire this? That's why he said, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, just a couple of you. Uh-uh. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is not for a select few. This is not just for a couple. The promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off. It is for everyone. It is for all generations. It is for us here today. And so I ask you, the way that Paul asked in that special spiritual diagnostic exam, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? No, no small wonder. The New Testament itself begins with the promise of the Holy Ghost. In a sense, the Old Testament closes with the promise of the Holy Ghost. The last prophet of the Old Testament, if you would, was a man we call John the Baptist. You raise your hand and say, but Brother Walkstetter, the New Testament records that. But remember the Testament, the, the dividing line between the Old and the New Testament is not that page between Malachi and Matthew. It is the cross itself. John the Baptist is an Old Testament character who points ahead to a promise of the Holy Spirit. That's why he said in Luke 3.16, you want to do something great? Look up all the verses that are 316 in the New Testament. And you'll just get excited reading. If you can't read anything else for the day, just read Matthew 316 and Mark 316 and Luke 316. And some of you have heard of John 316 and keep going like that. Luke 316, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you, catch this, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In other words, John was saying, there's one that's coming, and the reason he's better than me is because he can give you a baptism I can't give you. That baptism is that of the Holy Ghost. And and it's a baptism of fire. That's, that's the very close, if you would, of the Old Testament. Jesus will show up just a couple of months later after John will say this. But Jesus will point back to it in Acts chapter 1, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them, this is three and a half years later after his preaching, 
uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Notice he commanded them, don't leave home without it. Carl Malden used to say about the American Express card, don't leave home without it. I tell the apostolic church, don't leave home without the Holy Ghost. Don't try to do missions work without the Holy Ghost. Don't try to start a church or preach the gospel or think you're going to accomplish anything unless you have first been to an upper room and you receive the power from on high. Don't leave home without it. This also demonstrates that no one received the Holy Ghost in the time of the Gospels. Somebody says, I'm as saved as the thief on the cross. I'll go better than that. I'm more saved than the thief on the cross. Thief on the cross is Old Testament. I am New Testament. I have been born again of water and of the Spirit. That's why Jesus would say in John chapter 7, verse number 37, Catch this, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus uh, stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, catch this, he that believeth on me. Well, I believe on Jesus. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, brother Mark, shall flow rivers of living water. What was he talking about? Just feeling good? Just gotten goosebumps? No, John tells us, verse number 39, but this spake he of the spirit that they that believe on him should receive. I'm here to tell you something. If you truly believe on him, if you truly claim he's savior, there's something that should happen in your life. You should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. We can see here in Acts chapter number five, verse number 32. The apostle, as he is boldly proclaiming this gospel before the Sanhedrin, makes the following comment. And we are his witnesses. That, of course, ties directly back to the key verse of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. That we would receive power after that the Holy Ghost would come upon us. And they would be witnesses. We are his witnesses of these, these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. God has given the Holy Ghost. God wants to give the Holy Ghost to everyone here that will be obedient to the word and the will of God. It's not just for a select few. It's not just for any, meeny, miny, mo. It's for whosoever will. If you can open yourself up tonight, you tonight can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so Paul starts... Obey him how? As we can see here, God gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. How do I obey him? I obey him through the application of the gospel. And so when, when Paul asks these people, have you received the Holy Ghost since she believed? They say, we have not so much as heard. Acts chapter 19, verse number 2. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. We heard John prophesy about it. But we never heard of the fruition. We heard people talk about it. You know, it's sad to go to a church that just deals in history. You know, it's sad. To, you know, back in my day, when they tell us, the elders tell us, there used to be people that got the Holy Ghost. I kind of heard about that. Or people that are always looking ahead to prophecy. I want the experience today. I want something to happen tonight. I'm thankful for my heritage. There's probably no one that's more thankful for heritage than I am. And I love prophecy, but I want to see what God wants to do to us here tonight. And so when they say we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost, he's got to take a step back. He went from point number three now to point number two. Well, let me ask you a question there. You 12 elders over there. 
Under what then were you baptized? Let me check you out a little bit doctrinal heat here for a second. Some people say it doesn't matter how you're baptized. You got to tell that to Paul. Paul apparently decided it was time to check up on somebody to make sure that they had been properly dipped, that they had been properly washed, they had been properly immersed. Under what then were you baptized? Baptism, of course, goes with the presence of God. You don't have to get that far into the Word of God. You see the presence of God moving upon the face of the waters. Anytime you see the Spirit, it means God in action. And it's moving upon the face of the waters. That's a beautiful typification, if you would, of a twofold baptism of water and of spirit. There in Genesis chapter number 1, the first thing we see God doing here on planet Earth, even before man and woman were here. That's why Jesus would say quite clearly, John chapter 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, referring to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some people are saying, I'll believe it when I see it. The fact of the matter is you will not see the kingdom of God without the Holy Ghost, without this experience of being born again. That's why when Nicodemus began to question about what it really meant to be born again, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, John chapter 3, verse number 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So I've got news for you. You're not getting into the kingdom of God without it. As we've said before through the years, you can't join this church. You can't join this kingdom. You cannot immigrate to this country or this nation. You've got to be born into it. And you are born by water and you are born by spirit. Sometimes people try to explain that stuff away. Well, Jesus was talking about the water of birth. I love that. Somebody explain to me the next chapter, John chapter 4, verse number 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the disciples had heard, how that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. There were more people baptized under the ministry of Jesus Christ than in the ministry of John the Baptist. You know, the Bible never calls him really John the Baptist. They call him the Baptist. They also call him John, but never together like that. If it's possible, it should. That's great. We call him John the Baptist. Shouldn't we call him Jesus the Baptist? The Baptist people would love that, wouldn't they? He's Jesus the Pentecostal. Come on now. But the fact is, Jesus was very successful even before he baptized them with the Holy Spirit of making sure they were baptized by his own name. That's why he would say in Mark chapter number 16, verse number 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You always have somebody who's kind of smart, who tries to kind of find the middle line. Well, what if I believe and I'm not baptized? The fact of the matter is, that's what Paul is kind of asking. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Because your belief should motivate you to actually do something. That's why James talked about belief. And they said, well, we got faith. And he said, show me your works. I'll see your faith. Show me what your life is producing. He said, let me tell you about the devil. The devil's on his way to hell, but at least he believes in God so much that when he hears about the one God, he trembles. In other words, he believes it so much that there's actually excites within him some type of response. It's one thing for us to say we believe and we kind of nod our head casually. It's another thing we believe it so much it motivates us to do something we would not normally do. Like be baptized in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In that same great commission, Luke chapter number 24, verse number 47. 
Jesus said, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I understand the concept of repentance, but how is remission of sins actually applied? Well, didn't Peter tell us in Acts 2.38 that we'll repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? In this dispensation, we have the revealed name of God. His name is Jesus. And when we say the name of Jesus, we are incorporating all of the titles of the Old Testament in one glorious name. That's why we are buried in that name. That's why Peter would say in Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, Pastor Larson, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's one name, one Lord, one faith, one gospel, one baptism, and one name of salvation. Paul talking about his own experience of baptism. You know, Paul was baptized. You know, Paul was baptized. Sometimes people kind of miss that. Paul was baptized. And this is what Ananias said to him. In Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16, Paul is now testifying before a crowd, giving his personal testimony. And he says this, Ananias said to him, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In other words, there's that name that's called over you, and it's through the power of that name that the sins are remitted. I said the sins are washed away. Away. Somebody should be happy today. Two people were baptized in the name of Jesus. That means they came here heavy and broken and embittered by life. And they had so many things against them. But they have been washed away by the power of the gospel. By their faith in Jesus. And by the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody says, you know what, we ought to just, you know, why do we get all this doctrine stuff? I don't like doctrine. I just wish he just preached about Jesus. I just wish he preached about Jesus and that's all. This is not preached about, let's not get all separated by doctrine and stuff like that. I want to be separated. The Bible says he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. I don't want to hang around with a bunch of goats. I want him to be my shepherd that I follow all the way to the other side because the good shepherd cares for his sheep. And not only that, they hear his voice and they follow his word and his will and his presence and his spirit. And so we can see here, Acts chapter number 8, follow this with me just a second. The Bible says after the stoning of Stephen, the people scattered everywhere. In many ways, though, it was kind of like trying to blow on a forest fire to put it out. It didn't blow the fire out. It just spread it. The scripture says they went everywhere preaching the word. In verse number 4 of chapter uh, 8, therefore they were scattered abroad. They went everywhere preaching the word. I thought I made that up. Verse number 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. He's preaching Jesus. He's preaching what we're talking about here in the Easter season. Verse number 12. The Bible says, When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. He's preaching Jesus, which means he's preaching that there's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is a Jesus who has a kingdom of God, the same Jesus who said you've got to be born again of water and of spirit to enter or to see the kingdom of God. He goes on to say here that not only do they believe the kingdom of God, but they believe the things he preached concerning the name of Jesus Christ. What? They were baptized both men and women. Well, it really doesn't matter how you baptize because, you know, you can choose how you want to because it's just kind of a symbol. 
Acts chapter 8, verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's why we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because the Bible says to baptize in the name of Jesus. Because every time somebody's baptized, they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus in this dispensation. Because we are buried with him by baptism. We are buried with him, the one who died for us. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? In other words, we are baptized in the name of the man that was crucified for us. And so we can see here, if we get this thing back on, the fact of the matter is, in verse number 8, well, that's just one place. How about the same guy, Philip? finds an Ethiopian eunuch. It's a different venue. It's a different place. It's a different people. But the Bible says there's one lone man who's reading from Isaiah 53. And he asks, is this about this prophet? Who's he talking about? The scripture says in verse number 35 of Acts chapter 8, that Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Next verse and as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, Pastor Larson preached on this a couple of weeks ago. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? In other words, the preaching of baptism is the preaching of Jesus. The preaching of Jesus is the preaching of baptism. It's so vitally important that we understand the Holy Spirit that we have and the challenge we have for this last day world revival. Glory. Acts chapter 16. The Bible says that this, this Philippian jailer, the Filipino jailer, as pastor would say, thinking about the Philippines, verse number 30, brought them forth and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what? You're automatically saved right now. Not what it says. Thou shalt be saved. Let's take a step right now. And that you hold on till I can get you a little Bible study. How I can preach some Jesus to you. Somebody says, well, he just says believe. He's not even told them what to believe on. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What's that mean? Believe what about him? So let's, let's give this guy a little bit more knowledge and see what he does with that. Thou shalt be saved in thy house. If you take this literally the way some people take it, that means by this man's belief, everybody around him would automatically be saved. We know that's not right. He's talking about eventually. If you believe, eventually it will have the trickle-down effect of impacting everyone. If you truly believe the gospel, you got to keep reading. The Bible says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straight way. In other words, as soon as they possibly could do this. Acts chapter number 19. Let's bounce back there just for a second. This is now Paul back in Ephesus. We've not so much as heard whether it be in the Holy Ghost. How were you baptized? And they said, well, we've been baptized by John's baptism. Ah! I found out where you guys are. I know exactly, Brother Waddle, where you are. You're over there. But I know spiritually. I have given you a spiritual assessment test. And I've figured out you've got step one down. i got some good news for you. You've got step one down. You have shown sincerity before God. And you have shown that you want repentance to dwell in your life. And this is what he said. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to mess with some of your theology just for a second here. Probably everybody's theology, if that's okay. Spiritual assessment test. Because the fact of the matter is that any baptism that does not invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on it is a symbol or a token of repentance. It is a good step to take. You know, if you were, let's say you're Catholic here tonight, 
Thank you for coming. If you had your children baptized when they were a few days old, that was a great thing for you to do. It was a way of showing that you wanted something special to happen in their lives. And you were making a statement of your repentance. That's wonderful. If you were baptized in another church or baptized a different way, if you were sprinkled or, or somehow if they used a different formula outside the biblical formula, that was a great step for you to take. But it's simply a token of your repentance. Remission is found in the name of Jesus Christ. That's where it is found. It's in his name through faith in his name. And so please... Don't mistake a token and the symbol for substance and the true revelation. Tokens are fine in their place. It's wonderful if you say, you know what, I signed a card. Great for you. I'm glad you made a commitment. If you pray with rosary beads, God bless you. At least you're praying. But the fact of the matter is never mistake the token and the symbol for the true substance. And that is what's so hazardous in the world in which we live. That's why there are people, because they have not yet received what everything God has for them, and yet they're going to church that somebody is telling them, you're fine just the way that you are. I'm sorry, I love you too much just to sort of pat you on the head and take your money and put it in my pocket. I want to tell you, you've got to be born again of the water and the spirit. I want to challenge you, go for everything God has for you. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's not the people that just do good all the time. It's for somebody like a Jacob that says, God, you've got more for me. It's the Apollos that says, I know I'm mighty in the scriptures, but I'm limited in my experience. Oh, my friend, I know there are so many people, if they could just understand. Somebody says they're sincere, but the mark of true sincerity is what you do with truth. So the Bible says, when they heard this, these guys are sincere. Verse number 5, Acts 19, 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name yes. of the Lord Jesus. Yes. They heard this. They heard a little Bible study that Paul had with them about the revelation of who Jesus really was. And because of that, they were immediately submitted to the will and the word of God. And guess what? Now that they had step two, it's time for step three. It's time to make sure they have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some say the Holy Ghost naturally comes on you when you've done step two. Nay, nay. For the fact of the matter is, the apostles would not have to go to Samaria, would they? To pray for them. If Philip had already baptized them and then they received the Holy Ghost there. Uh-uh, it didn't work that way. There was still an experience that they had yet to receive. And that's why the Bible says, Acts chapter 19, verse number 6, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, get this, the Holy Ghost came on them. Oh, I'm thankful for a pastor putting his hands on me, but more importantly, I'm thankful when the Holy Ghost comes on me. When the Holy Ghost come on them, and how did they know they had the Holy Ghost? And they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now let me show you what God is able to do in a place of submitted people. You know, it's not easy sometimes to admit, I thought I had it all, but I only have 90% of it. I thought I had it all, but I only had half of it. I thought I had it all, but I'd only obeyed one portion of it. I'd only repented. The Bible says that when Paul found this fertile ground, people who were willing with their limited knowledge to expand upon it, the Bible says that he would continue there. Acts chapter 19, verse number 10. He continued there by a space of two years. Catch this. So that all they that dwelt at Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews 
and Greeks. In other words, it was a group of people who were hungry enough to put some traditions aside, put some old things aside, and get, said, guess what? We want what you're telling us. If God has more for me, I want it tonight. I said, I want it now. You realize if everybody in this church had that kind of attitude, we would impact the entire world. We could impact all of North America, all of California, all of San Diego County. If that attitude said, God, give me more. Every service, I want more of Jesus, more and more and more and more and more. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, verse number 17, the same place. It was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear, respect fell on all them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. When people are obedient to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, there is something that is magnified in that congregation. People hungry enough to say, you know what, maybe I don't have all of the answers. They become exemplary for others. As musicians come, Acts chapter 19, verse number 18, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Verse number 19, and many of them also which cues curious arts. Now check this out. Curious arts is another way of saying the occult. It's another way of basically saying black magic. It's another way of saying worshiping demonic forces. And y'all may play with the Ouija boards. Y'all may do the horoscope thing. I don't do that. I said, I don't do that stuff. I mean, sometimes people do on Facebook. Yeah, this is what my, my you know, this is what my future says according to my horoscope. Leave me out of that. I don't want any of that garbage. I'm sorry. Because, see, either it's foolishness that's too much like the world, or there are spirits behind it that I don't need, my friend. That's the way I see things. I don't watch movies about the occult and call that entertainment. I don't watch movies about people being demon-possessed and somehow eat popcorn and think, oh, that's fun. Because I'm either doing one thing. I'm either acting like that stuff is foolish and I'm fooling myself, or somehow I'm inviting those attitudes into my home. And there's more than just me in my home. I don't know if you're aware of that. And the fact is, I don't need that in my home, and you don't need that in your home either. These people, these people that believed, and because they believed, they received. When they received, the Bible says they came and they confessed, and they divested themselves of some things. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. Can you imagine having this attitude of saying, you know what? I'm not going to sell it on eBay. I'm not going to give it to a neighbor. I'm not going to donate it to the library. I'm just going to take it and throw it in the fire for myself. I'm not talking about book burning where you go into somebody else's house and trash their stuff. I'm talking about an attitude. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? I'm here to tell you something. We had some powerful moves of God. But if you listen to the same garbage, young people, if you listen to the same kind of unworldly, uh, ungodly, worldly music, the fact is that powerful move of God will evaporate and you will have quenched the Spirit. You got to divest yourself of some things when repentance really comes. Because humility produces more humility. The submission of the Ephesian elders yielded a tremendous revival. And there were people, Pastor, that brought these things together, burned them before all men. And somebody sat there and counted all that they had sacrificed. And they found it 50,000 pieces silver. I'm reminded every time I read that, I think of Judas Iscariot, who betrayed his Lord for what? 30 pieces of silver. He had the real thing, and he traded it away for 30 pieces of silver. 
But there were people who had invested a whole lot more in that which was false. They had invested a whole lot more in that which was bringing them down. And they said, you know what? I'm going to betray that for the real thing. I'm here to tell you there's somebody here tonight. It's time for you to betray, if you would, your old life. Divest yourself of the things of the past. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And the scripture goes on to say, 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The word of God will prevail, but it will only prevail in an environment where people are willing to believe and receive everything God's word has for them. I said everything God has for them. Have you reached a point, a plateau, where you've said, you know what, I got it, I'm good. Because the fact of the matter is, every time we understand the word of God, it's a journey. Following the spirit, it's like the children of Israel fire, following the fire of the cloud. You've got to get up every day and say, God, where are you taking me? You can't leave it all behind. You can't say, I'm going to just pitch here for a while because I'm tired. you got to get up tomorrow morning. Or I'm here to tell you, you'll be yesterday's news. But if there is a people that said, you know what? When I believed, I received the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. God planted something holy inside of me. And I need to reflect that holiness in the way I look in the way I talk, in the things I look at, I need to reflect his holiness in the way I treat the people in my life. Could we stand here today? I want the word of God to grow and prevail in this church. I'm restating the obvious, but I want God's word to grow and prevail. We had some people here today. We've had a number of the last few weeks who submitted themselves in the waters of baptism. I'd like for us to start, if you would. I want us to start with number one. Is that all right? Which, of course, is repentance. You know, repentance really is not an act. It's an attitude, and it's a lifestyle. Really, when a person ceases to repent, what they're doing is they're backsliding. They're going back to the old things of life. Sin is no more abhorrent to them. Now they play with it. They joke about it. They go to websites that have it and all of this kind of garbage. We have to have an attitude of repentance. And part of that attitude fears God and eschews or hates or shuns evil. And so I want that presence to be in this place right now, a spirit of repentance. The Bible says that godly sorrow works repentance not to be repented of. In other words, we don't change our mind about the mind change that he has placed in us. So I want that spirit of repentance to be here. Is that all right? I want us to reach out to the Lord across this place right now. Why don't you reach out to the Lord wherever you are. Raise your hands. Whatever's comfortable to you. And I want the presence of Jesus to be in this place to repent. Lord Jesus, we come before you repenting of our sins right now. We have all fallen short. We have all sinned that come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth righteous. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Father God, we're all sinners. Some of us are saved by your grace, and some of us are in the process of being saved. I pray that you would touch each and every one of us. Father, we present our sin before you right now. We understand that without you, we can do nothing. We cannot acquire salvation by, on our own, our own merit, our own good works. Some of us have made mistakes in our life even after we bowed a knee at the cross. But Father, I pray that that blood of Jesus would come fresh and new right now. Somebody pray with me. The blood of Jesus would flow fresh and clean right now and wash away all of our sins. Lord, I pray that you would touch us, Lord, today by your blood in the name of Jesus right now. If you need a special time of repentance, these altars are open. These altars are open if you need a special time of repentance. If you need to be baptized right now in the precious name, that's the next step. You know it. I said you know it. Nobody can do it for you. This is something mama can't do, daddy can't do. This is you. You understand. You are in need. Every moment.
of baptism, water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you come forward right now? One of these ministers will baptize you in that precious name here tonight. Maybe you need the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is here for you tonight. God can wash you. God can cleanse you. God can purge you. Maybe you've had the Holy Ghost for a long time, but there's been a time, a long period, it's not manifested in your life. You've not spoken in tongues for a long time. You, you've not prayed in a prayer language. You, you've not let God flow through you in that way. Maybe you'd like to come. You need a refilling. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe you're here tonight and you're struggling with some things and you just want somebody to pray with you in this house. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us. This is a spiritual hospital, an emergency room right now, a delivery room. I pray, God, that you would help us. Maybe somebody wants to come and reconsecrate themselves and make those changes and go home tonight and erase some things off of your iTunes. Get rid of some of the garbage. Understand it's not worth it. I come before you. Throw away some of that makeup. Maybe somebody needs to go in and begin to clean house a little bit. Understand. If you're remaining back there, would you pray with us right now? If you're back in the back, continue to pray right now. We've got some great saints. We've got some folks right now that are trying to get a hold of God. Lord Jesus, let's create the atmosphere. Spiritual rebirth to take place in this house. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. Oh, that's it. Somebody get a hold of Jesus. Just like the first time. Jesus, I bow the knee. Every I repent of my sins right now. And I leave it all at the altar. At the altar, things are consumed.